Hi, I'm Stacy Keach. Join me right now for mysterious places as we travel to Israel's Judean desert. Every day just before dawn, hundreds of people set out on an arduous hike up a rugged plateau. They come from different places, speak different languages, worship according to different faiths. But they all come for the same reason, to see the place where one of the most haunting chapters in Jewish history unfolded. They come to see an imposing stone fortress built atop this mountain. Rising 1,300 feet above the Dead Sea, this is Masada. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a young Jewish rebel stood atop a mountain fortress in the Judean desert. He watched as the massive and superior Roman army closed in. The young rebel offered to his followers an alternative to dying at the hands of the Romans. The extraordinary events that followed were recorded in sometimes gory detail by Josephus Flavius, known as the chronicler of the Jewish-Roman wars. If not for Flavius, what happened at Masada might have passed into the realm of folklore. But his moving account of the events of 73 AD draw us to Masada even today. The first century AD, a time known as the Jewish-Roman Wars. It was a time when the fortress of Masada stood at the center of a tragic clash between two cultures. The Jews who considered Judea their homeland and the Romans who occupied this land. Beginning in 66 AD, the Jews rose up against the Romans. Though tens of thousands were slaughtered, a small group of Jewish rebels or zealots managed to escape from Jerusalem. About a thousand of these zealots sought refuge in the desert fortress of Masada. More than 20,000 Romans pursued them surrounding the fortress. For almost two years, a fierce standoff ensued. The Romans stormed the fortress only to discover the bodies of 960 zealots, willing participants in a mass suicide. But this history, in many ways, remains a mystery. Archaeologist Ehud Netzer has studied Masada for 30 years. Well, there are different opinions about what happened uh, in, in Masada. Uh, w one big question is whether the zealots really committed suicide or not. The only account of what happened at Masada was written by the first century historian Josephus Flavius, a man who hadn't even witnessed the events firsthand. And so the validity of Josephus's account has been called into question by many scholars. Robert Goldenberg is a professor of Judaic studies at Stony Brook University. Some people think that Josephus made up the story um, because the story on the face of it is so shocking. Jews were not supposed to do things like that. So with the written record debatable, the challenge to researchers is clear. What really happened at Masada on that fateful night? Was it mass suicide or, as some have suggested, mass murder? To explore these haunting questions, you must first explore the remarkable history of the fortress itself and the surrounding area. 35 miles southeast of Jerusalem, on the border between Israel and Jordan, the Dead Sea rests 1,200 feet below sea level. It is the lowest place on Earth. The water here is so mineral rich that bathers can only float. 
the Dead Sea is surrounded by the Judean Desert. And it is here, two and a half miles west of the Dead Sea, that Masada rises up from the earth, a great diamond-shaped plateau extending nearly 2,000 feet from north to south. Masada's most striking feature is its isolation. You can ride a cable car to the top of the mesa. But to fully understand Masada's suitability as a fortress, as a haven for the zealots, you must climb it. Winding its way up the sharp eastern slope of the mountain, the snake path is a rigorous climb. Best approached in the early morning before it gets too hot. The western slope, only about 250 feet from bottom to top, offers a slightly easier path. At the top, you are greeted by a seemingly featureless plateau. But explore further and you discover the hidden Masada. Stairways, walls, entire rooms begin to emerge. Very elaborate buildings have been preserved and at least the floor plans have been preserved and the interior decorations have been preserved and people can see quite a bit about what a luxurious dwelling was like about 2,000 years ago. Long before the gruesome events of 73 AD, Masada was the domain of the great Judean king Herod. He saw Masada's potential as a natural fortress and around 40 BC began building here. You can still see remnants of his architectural feats, which were considerable. The massive defense wall once enclosed the entire mountaintop, an area comprising more than 20 acres. It was topped by 35 lookout towers. Large granaries, some measuring up to 90 feet long, formed an elaborate storage system. And all around, you can see evidence of the luxury Herod once enjoyed here, especially at his incredible three-tiered royal villa, or hanging palace, which clings to the northern edge of the summit. Really one of the pearls of, of Herod's building projects. Uh, I have no doubt that it's Herod's personal imagination to build a palace on three natural steps. It's, it's unique elsewhere, and we did the highlight of Herod's architecture in Masada. Today, the best preserved section of the palace lies on the bottom slope. Remnants of its once vivid painting survive under glass. The western palace near the center of the site was where Herod received his guests. Here you can discover one of the oldest color mosaics in Israel. It is believed that Herod built his fortress on Masada as a refuge from his greatest enemy, the Jews. They hated Herod for his allegiance to the Romans. So it is ironic that nearly 100 years after Herod's death, his fortress would become the symbol of Jewish defiance, as well as the site of one of history's most incredible dramas. Stay with us as we continue our investigation of Masada. Here's a mysterious place's travel to. Buses depart hourly from Jerusalem to Herod's fortress at Masada and take about one and a half hours to reach the site. If you choose to climb Masada, get an early start and bring a hat and canteen. Midday temperatures at the top of Masada often exceed 100 degrees. We're back in Israel with the secrets of Masada. To the thousands who visit every year, a trip to Masada is an adventure, a chance to challenge its steep cliffs. But it is also a chance to explore a place that played an important part in Jewish history. Masada is a moving symbol of the age-old Jewish wish to live their own way of life free of the interference of other people. In the first century AD, 
that struggle was in the hands of Jewish zealots. The zealots actually began their path to Masada 35 miles southwest in the city of Jerusalem. Perched on a rocky spur carved from the Judean hills, Jerusalem is a city divided. This division has inspired great conflicts over the centuries. One of the greatest was the uprising of 66 AD. In the seven years of the uprising, tens of thousands of Jews who rebelled against the Roman occupation were either slaughtered or enslaved. Their great temple in the center of Jerusalem was burned. The Roman emperor Titus successfully crushed the rebellion, but not before the small band of Jews, those who would later die at Masada, managed to escape. They joined the rebel leader Eleazar ben Yair and set out for the fortress. They were hungry and tired, many were wounded, and they barely survived their trek across the desert. Today you can visit some of the places which played a role in their survival. En Gedi, a small settlement 10 miles south of Masada. Fed by four natural springs, and Getty is the largest oasis on the western shores of the Dead Sea. It is rich in agriculture and wildlife. Today's visitor is drawn by the recreational possibilities. The zealots were drawn here for quite another reason. Since their plan was to live out their days at Masada, they raided the settlement's abundant food supply and massacred the residents. Rich with the supplies stolen from Engedi, the zealots entrenched themselves at Masada. There they would meet their fate. By the time the zealots reached Masada, they were the last surviving rebels of the Jewish uprising. Led by General Flavius Silva, the Romans had pursued the zealots. Arriving at the eastern foot of the mountain, Silva was greeted by the fortress looming above. He planned his assault. Really, in, in Masada, we can follow uh, the whole evidence of, of how the Roman functioned. You can see the camps, there are eight camps, some of them smaller, some of them bigger, all around uh, Masada. Silva established eight camps at key points around the base of the rock then constructed a siege wall two miles long. But his greatest achievement came at the western side of Masada, a distance of just 250 feet to the top. What the most striking uh, object is the siege ramp that uh, they built during the siege, and this is what enabled them to come up and ultimately break in. For nearly a year, the Romans toiled under brutal conditions. To build a siege uh, a ramp, that, that took time. And uh, it might be not in easy conditions if the people from top uh, try to avoid them doing it. Like throwing big stones, we have a group of very big round stones on Masada, very heavy, that you can roll down and that could be very frightening and very effective if it hit a unit of Romans. But with the forced labor of 10,000 Jewish slaves, the Romans prevailed. After completing the siege ramp, General Silva transported his secret weapon to the top of the mountain, a battering ram. Day after day, it pounded against the outer wall of the fortress, eventually opening up a hole in the defense wall. The zealots had built an inner wall of wood, the Romans then hurled flaming torches at the wall, eventually setting it on fire. It was the beginning of the end for the zealots, but how that end came is the subject of much controversy. If we are to believe the historian Josephus, on the night before their defeat, the zealots gathered together before their leader, Ben Yair. It was then that he urged them to leave the Romans nothing to triumph over but the bodies of those who dared to be their own executioner. He urged them to agree to a mass suicide. Then, according to Josephus, after killing their families, the men, quote, 
cast lots for the selection of ten men out of their number to destroy the rest. Then they cast lots again to see which man would kill the other ten, then commit suicide. How could Josephus know this? At the time, he claimed there were several zealots who did not go along with the plan. They hid in caves as the others participated in their mass suicide. It is their version of the events Josephus claimed to tell. Yet, not all modern scholars support Josephus' account. They believe the zealots may, in fact, have suffered an even more gruesome fate. Stay with us as we continue with Mysterious Places. We're back in Israel with the secrets of Masada. In the fall of 1963, one of Israel's leading archaeologists stood atop Masada and surveyed the barren plateau. His name was Yigal Yadi, and for the next 11 months, he led an international team of archaeologists in an excavation of Masada. Working under the blazing sun, the team ultimately excavated over 10 miles of walls, 4,000 coins, countless ceramics and other artifacts. Much of what you can see at Masada today is due to their extraordinary efforts. You can see the oldest synagogue discovered in Israel, or in fact, the world. A Torá, os manuscritos, que depois de terminar a liturgia, Stone benches surround the sacred chamber, which was once filled with columns to support the roof. At the columbarium, you can see the small holes that once held the ashes of non-Jewish members of Herod's garrison. While Yardin was interested in unearthing these buildings, he also had another mission in mind, to solve the mystery of what really happened at Masada on that fateful night in 73 AD. Was there any archaeological evidence to support the story of Masada as told by Josephus? In fact, as the digging continued, evidence was uncovered supporting at least part of Josephus' account. Most of what Josephus tells us we can prove today, to my mind, archaeologically. He described the hill and it fits quite well the reality. The fact that there was a Roman siege, we have evidence that the Jewish zealots built the wooden wall to, to stop the Romans. And then we have evidence for what happened in the last night. The palace was burned, other wings were burned. So while the evidence was strong that a siege did take place at Masada, there was something missing, evidence to support the suicide theory. Over the years, scholars had called into question Josephus' account of the mass suicide. The alternative would be that the Romans broke in and slaughtered them all, and then for some reason didn't want to take responsibility for doing this, so that they had Josephus concoct that story. That's not out of the question. Then, several months into the dig, the archaeologist made a remarkable discovery that seemed to support Josephus. One of the highlights of, of the finds in Masada was a group of ceramic uh, pieces with inscribed in, in, in Hebrew, uh, what we call Ostraka. And uh, there were 11 names, one of them Ben Yair, which was the name of, of the leader. Could these lots have been the lots cast by the zealots almost 2,000 years ago? If these lots strongly supported the mass suicide theory, then other even more compelling questions were instantly raised. Among them, what happened to the bodies of the zealots? Again, the earth offered up more secrets. During the excavations, the major excavations, 30 skeletons about were found in a cave at one side of Masada. So they definitely could belong to, to this uh, um, event, or to be part of this event. According to Josephus, nearly 960 zealots committed suicide. Why then were only 30 bodies discovered? Ehud Netzer believes there could be a simple explanation. Open question, only if, if there would be a, 
a tomb uh, with, with 900 bodies, then of course people may be convinced. But that's, uh, I don't know if the, this will be ever proved because the Romans could throw the, the bodies to the cliffs and, and then birds of prey could, could uh, eat, eat uh, the bodies and they could disappear. And so we end where we began, with a mystery, deep and seemingly impenetrable. While some still search for the truth, others say the truth doesn't matter. They say what really matters is Masada as a symbol, a powerful symbol of courage, of fortitude, and of the mortal struggle to escape the bonds of repression. Like many dictators, King Herod left behind an extraordinary architectural legacy. But no stone monument could ever touch us the way we are touched by the one human act of self-sacrifice of Masada. It is a timeless lesson in the price of freedom. Until next time, I'm Stacy Keach for Mysterious Places. Travel for Mysterious Places provided by Tower Air.